Hello, Matthew. Good morning, Father. Why are you sitting here alone? Where is Lucy and George? Lucy is there. And George is over there. What happened? Why aren't you guys playing together? Lucy and George had a fight and they are not talking to each other. <laughs> Is that so? And why did they fight with each other? Mm, we were playing hide and seek and Lucy is saying that George cheated. <laughs> mm, now go and tell them that I want to talk to them. I will tell them, father. Lucy, Lucy. Lucy. Go away, Matthew. I don't want to talk to anybody. Lucy, Father John is here and he's calling you. I'm coming. All right, you go ahead. I have to call George also. George, George, Father John is calling you. Huh? Let's go then. Hey there, good morning. Why are you silent? Aren't you going to wish me back? Good morning, Father. Matthew told me that you both had a fight. Is that right? Yes, Father. This is George, he... No, don't tell me the reason, Lucy. She's lying, Father. It was she. Stop it, George. Now listen. Whatever the reasons might be, I want you both to forgive each other and say that you were sorry. But father... Lucy... I'm sorry, George. I shouldn't have fought with you. I'm sorry too. You're my best friend, Lucy. And I'll never repeat this. <laughs> See? Wasn't that easy? Thank you, father. Hmm. Now come on. Let's sit here. Today... I'm going to tell you the story of Ruth, a Moabite woman. She was an excellent example of how one should trust God. Her selfless love and total dedication to her mother-in-law is depicted as an example for all generations. Wow! Tell us a story, Father. All right. Now listen carefully. Long time back, in a place called Moab, there lived a woman named Naomi. Her husband had died a long time back, and now recently, her two sons too died. She was now left with the wives of her sons, Orpha and Ruth. There's no point of sitting here and crying. We can do nothing about it now. Ruth, you must listen to what I'm going to tell you. What is it, mother? My daughters, you're still young. Go back to your people and marry again. You can have children of your own one day. Mother, what are you saying? No, Ruth. Stop. You must do what I say. I'm going back to Bethlehem and you can't come with me. But... Why can't I come to Bethlehem with you? Because you're a Moabite woman and in Israel, you'll always be a foreigner, my dear. Orpha, will you at least listen to me? I will do whatever you wish me to do. Thank you, dear. Thank you so much. Now, Ruth, please. Mother, please don't insist. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you die, I will die. 
your people shall be my people and your god will be my god oh dear Ruth refused to part her mother and they both traveled together to Bethlehem. Do you see that mountain Ruth? That one? Yes, that's Nebo. It was from there that Moses viewed Canaan. Nebo? Hmm. Poor Moses. Why did you say that, mother? Oh, that. That's because after leading all the Israelites from Egypt, he died there. He died at the threshold of the promised land. The God of Israel is a God of the poor. He will not abandon me. While they were traveling, Naomi narrated the history of Israel to Ruth. And after many days of traveling, they finally reached Naomi's house in Bethlehem. Hey, look. Who are they? Hmm. I think I've seen that face before. Hmm. Isn't that Naomi? Yes, it's her. Come on. Naomi! Naomi, it's you! Naomi! You look so different. Yes, it's been so long since you left. Where is Elimelech and your sons? What happened, Naomi? No, don't call me that anymore. Don't call me Naomi. My life has become like this ruined house. I had everything when I left here, but I've come back empty-handed. I'm no more Naomi, the happy one. I'll be called Mara, the sorrowful from now on. Don't worry, Naomi. It will be all right. <laughs> but the God hasn't abandoned me totally. He has left me with her, the wife of my son. She is a good woman. May God bless you. For many days, their neighbors helped them by giving food to eat. Mother, <laughs> Ruth, what is it? How long are we going to live on this charity? Yes, our neighbors are kind, but we mustn't burden them. Mother, I was thinking. What, dear? I was thinking that I can go and work somewhere. What? Yes, mother. Look, I'm healthy and I can work. But dear, I can't bear that. Listen to me, mother. This is harvest season and I can go into the fields and glean. No, I can't bear to see my daughter glean in a stranger's land. But why should we be ashamed? You have told me that our God is the God of poor. That's right. But they might insult you calling you a foreigner. Mother, don't worry. I shall return by evening. God, father of orphans and protector of widows, please watch over my daughter. And that day, Ruth went to work in the fields. She started collecting the leftover ears of corn.
Ah, it is scorching and I am thirsty. Where can I get some water? The field that Ruth chose to work that day was owned by Boaz, a relative of Naomi. On that day, Boaz came to the field to oversee the reaping. Who is that young woman? Oh, her. Do you remember your aunt Naomi? Naomi? Wife of Elimelech. Yes, that young woman is the daughter-in-law of Naomi. She has me permission to glean in your field, and I allowed. Hmm. They are poor widows. She hasn't taken any break all day. Hmm. I remember Naomi. She was a good woman and she was tried very hard. What's your name? Ah, uh, me? Yes, you come here. Yes, master. What's your name? My name is Ruth. I am wife of Naomi's son. I know. I am a relative of Naomi. Oh. You don't have to go anywhere else for gleaning. No one will bother you here. You may drink water from my servant's draw. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. But what have I done to deserve this? You? You left everything and came here with your mother-in-law? Come with me. We'll have something to eat. Here, have this. Hmm, this is such delicious bread. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. Can I take this bread to my mother? She will like this very much. Of course you can. Thank you. Boaz liked Ruth very much and he decided to help her. You pull a few ears of corn from the bundle and let them fall down. Let Ruth collect those. You have a good heart, Master. Lord God, protector of the weak, wonderful are your ways. Ruth, how was your day? And... And... How did you get so much grain? Ah... Uh, mother... Lord led me into the field of a man called Boaz, a very generous man. Did you, did you say Boaz? <laughs> yes, he told me he was a relative of yours. Yes, he is my nephew, my cousin's son. He was so kind, he gave me a lot of bread and roasted grains too. Thank you God. He also allowed me to glean in his field till the end of the harvest season. That's wonderful. Mother, let's give some bread and grains to our neighbor, Lady Maka. Yes, she is a kind woman and she helped us so much. Until the end of harvest season, Ruth gleaned in the fields of Boaz. She gleaned during the day 
and at night she sewed clothes for the poor. Hmm. Let's go to bed, dear. You've been working all day. You go ahead, mother. I will finish this one and join you. But Ruth, look at you. You look so tired. Don't worry, mother. I will join you. Besides tomorrow, we are having the harvest feast. Boaz has invited me to. Really? You must wear your best clothes and don't forget to put on your ornaments too. <laughs> I will, mother. Now you go ahead and sleep. This is big. Ha ha ha. Huh? This is the biggest harvest we had had in years. God has blessed us. God has been generous to you because you have been generous to poor people. Isn't that? Isn't that Ruth? Ruth? Where? I can't see her. Look at the front. No. I can't. Her? Huh? It is her. She is so beautiful. Yes, I too didn't realize that. Poor woman though. She has a good heart. She works all day and then she sews clothes for the poor. Hmm. I must pay a visit to her mother tomorrow. And the next day, Boaz came to Naomi's house. Good heavens. Boaz, my nephew. Hello, aunt. It's so good to see you. I I I am ashamed to receive you in this poor shack. Oh, aunt. The condition of this house doesn't matter at all as long as you are happy. Happiness? That is not for me. I I lost everything. Everything except this daughter whom Don't worry. I'm here to talk about that daughter. Huh? What about Ruth? I uh, I wanted to talk to you first. Um I like to marry Ruth. But only if you have no objection. Lord, you have heard my prayer. What do you say? Oh, Boaz, we will be honored, but but what? You know, as per our custom, my brother's son is the next of the kin. Your brother's son? Who? Sikri? Hmm, yes. As long as Sikri gives away his right, you cannot marry Ruth. Hmm. I didn't think about that. I'm sorry, Boaz. I want you to marry Ruth. I really do. But Hmm. I have to think about this. Don't worry, aunt. I'll talk to Sikri and figure out a solution. The next day, Boaz gathered Sikri and 10 elders at the city gate. Everyone the widow of Elimelak is selling a piece of land Sikri you are the next of their kin you are entitled to buy it Do you want to buy it Yes I will buy the land from Elimelak's widow And as you buy the land you are bound to marry her daughter-in-law She is a more abite woman You must marry her and restore her late husband's name. What? Are you joking? Are you saying that I should marry a Gentile woman? A foreigner? Yes, that is the law of Israel. If you buy the land, then you will have to marry her. Huh? No. 
Uh, no, I don't want the land. Huh. What? Are you giving up your right? Yes, I am. I don't want to marry a Moabite woman. Then you must swear it. Sekri, you must renounce your right in our custom. Give your shoe to Boaz. All right. Here. I hereby renounce my right to buy Naomi's land. And as a sign, I'm giving my shoes to Boaz. We hereby proclaim Boaz as the legitimate here of Naomi's property. Boaz's plan worked and Sikri renounced his rights. After a few days, Boaz married Ruth. According to the law of Moses and Israel, I accept you, Ruth, as my wife. I shall be faithful to you until death. May the God of Israel look kindly upon you. May you be honored in Israel through your descendants. Ruth and Boaz had a son, and they named him Obed. And Obed's son, Jesse, was the father of King David. That was a great story, father. Yes, father, we loved it. Hmm, now shall I ask you a few questions from the story then? Yes, father. Why did Naomi and Ruth go back to Bethlehem? Naomi's husband had died a long time ago and she lost her sons too. Naomi and Ruth had no one else in Moab and that's why she left to her hometown. Excellent, George. And was Ruth born in Bethlehem too? No, father. Ruth was born in Moab and she was a Moabite. Good, Lucy. Now tell me why Naomi changed her name. Naomi meant the happy one. When Naomi lost her husband and her sons, she decided to change her name to Mara, which meant the sorrowful one. Right again, George. Now tell me how Boaz and Naomi were related. Boaz was Naomi's nephew. That was quick, Matthew. Good one. Hmm. Now tell me why Sikri refused to marry Ruth. Sikri did not want to marry a Gentile woman widow and that's why he let go of his right for Naomi's land. That's right again. And for the last question, how was King David and Ruth related? Boaz and Ruth had a son named Obed who was the grandfather of King David. That's correct, George. It's time for us to leave. Father, what story are you going to tell us tomorrow? Tomorrow? Hmm. Uh, I'll tell you the story of Samuel tomorrow, my child. Ah, the story of Samuel? Yes, the story of Samuel. We will meet again tomorrow. Goodbye, children. Goodbye, Goodbye Father. Father. Good evening, kids. So, are you ready for today's story? Today's story is based on one of the biblical group of books called the Book of Jonah. This group of biblical books is called the Twelve Minor Prophets. Long, long ago, there lived a man called Jonah in Israel. He was the son of Amittai and he lived during the reign of Jeroboam II. Jonah preached to his people about God's love. And like God, Jonah tried to love all people and creatures God had created. Oh, hello there. Hmm, it's been a good day. Hello, are you hungry, my friend? Hmm. All right. I've got plenty of peanuts with me. Come on. You can have this. Don't worry. Go on. You can eat that. <laughs> have a good day, my friend. Huh? What is that noise? Sounds like someone is fighting. 
It's my robe. No, it's mine. Get away from me. This man is a cheater. He is lying. Huh? Stop. Go away, you. Stop it. Fighting wouldn't solve your problem. I saw this first. No, I did. Come on, you two. God doesn't like people who fight. It upsets him. Ah! Ah! You see, now neither one of you gets the robe. You are behaving like someone from the city of Nenoa. Huh? No, don't say that. We are not like the Nenoites. Yes, Jonah, the Nenoites are enemies of our people. Please don't compare us to them. I heard they stole the goods from one of our traders yesterday. They are the thieves. And the young ones there doesn't respect the elders. They are so cruel. Yes, they are very bad people. Do you want God to think that we are like them? No! no. We are sorry, Jonah. We will start behaving like Israelites from now on. Good. Then you mustn't fight anymore. Jonah kept teaching the people about God's laws to the Israelites. That night, Jonah, as usual, was strolling outside his house after his dinner. That was when God spoke to him and gave him a very huge task to do. Jonah! Huh? Who was it? Jonah! God, it's you! Jonah, I have an important job for you. What is it, my lord? I will do anything for you. The people of Nineveh are not obeying my laws, Jonah. They steal from each other. The children are not respecting their elders. And men are lazy there. Even the king is corrupt and he is not taking care of the problems. Yes, my lord. The Nanawites are bad people. They are bad because they don't know about me. No one has taught them my laws. Jonah, get up and go to this great city. Tell them I am about to destroy their city in 40 days because of their wickedness. Me? I... I can't go to Nineveh. Please, please give me some other job. No, you must do what I ask you. But, but they are the enemies of my friends and neighbors. They are the enemy of my city. You must go, Jonah. In 40 days, I am going to punish them. God, God, I don't understand. God is going to punish the Nanoites, but, but what if we tell them about God and they change their ways? No, I can't let that happen. They are my enemies. Jonah got very confused. He called his friends home and seeked their advice. Hmm, your fear is right, Jonah. I think you shouldn't go there at all. Yes. How can I preach to our enemies? No, you can't. Don't tell them about God. But won't I be offending God if I don't preach to them? Hmm, I think I have an idea. I'm going to hide from God. Ha <laughs> ha, you're joking now. Where can you hide from God? Hmm, I don't think I can hide from God by staying in Israel. I have to get out of here. So, where are you planning to go? I... I will go as far from Nineveh as I can. I will go in the opposite direction so that God won't find me. You can go to Tarshish. It's pretty far from Nineveh. Yes, God will never find you there. Hmm. I think it's a good idea. 
I will go to Tarshish and God will never find me there. So Jonah started his journey towards Tarshish. He traveled through the desert for many days trying to run away from God. And after traveling for many days, he finally arrived at the harbor of Jaffa. Hmm. I've lost the person standing there. Excuse me. Yes. What do you want? Hello. Can you tell me where the ship is going? We are going to Tarshish to buy gold and silver. Why do you ask? Hmm. Can you please take me with you? I too am going there on urgent business. Of course you can, but you will have to pay us once we reach there. Sure, Captain. Thank you so much. Hey, but listen. Let me tell you this beforehand. The journey through the sea might get rough. You must. No problem, Captain. I will manage it. So Jonah climbed aboard, and they started traveling towards Tarshish. They traveled for many days in the sea. The captain and other crew in the ship did not worship the god of Israel, and instead they were worshiping idols made of stone. After traveling for some time, the captain saw a terrible storm coming. Men, watch out! There's a storm coming! Oh, oh no! I've never seen something like that before. The storm grew stronger. and their ship was in a lot of trouble the ship is going to sink throw the cargo into the sea yes captain captain we have thrown away everything that we could find but there's no use the ship is sinking Pray to the gods. One of you pray to the wind god. You, you pray to the god of the seas, and I will pray to the sun god. The men started praying for many gods, seeking help, but it was of no use. The storm got worse and worse. Captain, captain. What is it? I found him sleeping in the room below. He was snoring like nothing was going on. Huh? How dare you? Don't you want to be saved? Pray to the god of sea for saving us. I I don't think praying to the god of sea is going to help you. Huh? What's going on? Hmm. Somebody has brought bad luck to our voyage. Very bad luck. That's right. This is all happening because of bad luck. We have to find out who it is, else we are going to die today. Let's draw lot and see who brought us bad luck. Yes, come here, everyone. The captain and his crew were very superstitious, and they decided to cast lots and find out who brought them bad luck. It's you. You are the one who brought us bad luck. Me? Ah. Uh, uh. Tell us the truth. Who are you? Where do you come from? And why did you get on this ship? Hmm. All right. I will tell you the truth. My name is Jonah and I'm a prophet from Israel. Huh? A prophet? Why are you here on the ship? I I worship the god of heaven and I'm running away from him. Running away? So this is happening all because of you? Jonah, tell us what should we do now? Yes. How do we make the storm go away? You you have to throw me overboard. It's because of me that God has sent the storm. Huh? Throw you into the sea? We got to throw someone into the deep sea. Come on everyone. Find all the remaining cargo and throw into the sea. No. No. It's not going to help. You must throw me into the sea. Captain, Jonah must be telling the truth. There's no other way. No. I I can't do that. Look, Captain. 
Can't you see that his god is more powerful than any of our god? Jonah, I am sorry. We tried everything to save the ship. We now have to throw you out of the ship. I know, Captain. It's me who made God angry. And I deserve to be punished. God of Israelites, we are sorry for throwing Jonah into the sea. Please forgive us. We are sorry, Jonah! As soon as they threw Jonah into the sea, the storm disappeared and the water became calm again. Huh? <laughs> now I don't have to go to Nehnovah. Huh? What's that? Is that... Is that a whale? Suddenly, a huge whale came from nowhere and swallowed Jonah. Oh! When Jonah opened his eyes after some time, he found himself inside the whale's belly. Huh? Where am I? Huh? It's stinking. Am I? Am I inside the whale's belly? When Jonah realized that he was inside the whale's belly, he understood his mistake and he prayed to God. God, I'm so sorry. I was a fool trying to run away from you. Please forgive me, God. Jonah prayed for three days and three nights inside the whale's belly. And on the third day, the whale vomited Jonah onto the shore of Nineveh. Thank you, God, for saving me. Jonah, now go to the city and give them my message. Yes, God, I'm ready for it now. So Jonah went to Nineveh and started speaking about God. All the people of Nineveh listened to him and they started to change themselves. People of Nineveh, you must leave your wicked ways and obey God's laws. God is going to destroy your city in 40 days if you don't repent. Huh? What he says must be the truth. Yes, we must repent for all our wrongdoings. I must inform this to the king. My lord, a prophet has come from Israel and he's warning our people that our city is going to be destroyed. Hmm, a prophet. If it's a prophet, then he must be saying the truth. We have sinned gravely. We must do as what he says. We must repent for our sins. We will all fast, starting tomorrow, for penance. Everyone should cover their body with ashes and wear only rags. Let us pray for his mercy. We must show Israel's God that we are sorry for acting so badly. Send out these orders immediately. Yes, my lord. After Jonah told the Neovites about God and his laws, the people changed and they started repenting for their sins. Jonah then left the city. He then walked to a nearby hill overlooking the city and sat there to watch God punish them. He waited and waited and waited, but nothing happened to the city. I knew it. God is not going to punish them because they repented. Lord, why did you make a fool out of me? You dragged me over and forced me to speak. But now, now what I told them is never going to happen. Huh. Jonah realized that God will not destroy the city because the Ninevites had repented. He turned back and walked into the desert. Jonah walked for many days without food and water. He was really tired. Huh. Huh. I'm so tired and hungry. Oh, thank you, God.
thank you for this plan and saving me. But the next morning, when Jonah woke up, he found the plant dead. Huh? What? A worm had attacked the plant and because of him, the plant had died. You! It's because of you that the plant died. I'm going to kill you now. Jonah. God. Jonah. Why are you angry? This worm, it killed the plant which gave me shelter. You are mad because the plant is dead. You are caring about this small plant, but the whole city of Nineveh doesn't concern you. What did you do to keep it alive? So? What do you think? If I punished all the men, women, and children, in Nineveh. I made them and cared for them for many years. They never knew about me or loved me until you came. Ah. Now tell me, shouldn't I still care about them? Yes. Yes, you should. Now, go home. Tell your people about Nineveh and the plant. Spread my message to everyone. Jonah understood God's message. He returned to Israel and started spreading the message of God's love to everyone. Ha 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 ha! That was a great story, Father. And it was very funny too. I'm glad you liked it. Are you ready for the questions? Yes, Father. All right, now tell me. Where did God ask Jonah to go and preach? To Nanoah. That's correct, Matthew. Why did Jonah obey God and run away? Nanoites were the enemies of Israel. Jonah was afraid that he would be helping Nanoites by telling them God's message. He wanted them to get punished. So he ran away so that he won't have to preach to them. Very good, Lucy. Where was Jonah trying to go? He was trying to go to Tarshish. And did he reach there? No. When Jonah was traveling in a ship, God sent a storm and the sailors were forced to throw Jonah into the sea. Good. What happened to Jonah while he was in the sea? A huge whale came and swallowed Jonah. Did he die then? No. He stayed alive inside the whale's belly for three days. Good, Matthew. All right, now tell me what was the message that God wanted Jonah to deliver to the Nanoites? God wanted Jonah to warn them that the city of Nineveh was going to be destroyed in 40 days because of the sins they had committed. And did he destroy the city? No. When the people of Nineveh heard Joshua's message, they repented and mourned for their sins. God was kind to them and he did not destroy the city as he had warned. Haha, <laughs> that's correct, Lucy. Hmm, it's getting late. We have to leave now. Father, are you gonna tell us the story of another prophet tomorrow? No, tomorrow I will tell you the story of Job, who was a rich man in Israel and who was also a faithful servant of God. I will see you tomorrow then. Goodbye, kids. Goodbye, Goodbye Father. Father. Good morning, children. Good morning, Father. Did you all like the story of Jacob I told you yesterday? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm glad you liked it. Do you have any doubts from the story? Father, I have a doubt. Yes, Lucy. Father, why did Jacob receive the blessing even though Esau was the firstborn? That's a good question. Mm, sit down and I'll answer your question. Usually the paternal blessings are given to the firstborn, but Esau had given his birthright as the firstborn to Jacob, and that's why Jacob was able to receive the blessing. Do you remember how Jacob got the birthright? Yes, one day when Esau was hungry, 
he spoke the birthright to Jacob in exchange for the food Jacob had made. That's correct. He was always a schemer, and that's why he was named Jacob. Does anyone remember what the name of Jacob means? Jacob means the one who grasps the heel. Hmm, that's correct. And why was he named that? Because he was holding the heels of his older brother when he came out of his mother's womb. You've got that correct. Good one, Matthew. Now, who can tell me about the promise that Jacob made at Bethel? Me, me. Yes, George. Tell me. When God spoke to Jacob at Bethel, he realized that the place was a gateway to heavens. He swore an oath that he will come back to the same place. He also swore that the Lord will be his only God. Correct. And where did he go from there? He left for he ran from there. That's very good, George. All right, let me continue from where I stopped yesterday. Hey, you little one. Here, eat some grass. Oh, so you're not hungry. Jacob stayed at Laban's place for 30 days. He looked after Laban's sheep while he was there. During his stay here, Jacob and Rachel grew quite close to each other, and Jacob fell in love with Rachel. I have brought you some water. Oh, you don't have to, you know. Don't you drink water? Yes. Yes, I meant I mean, uh, thank you anyway. Here then, have this. Hmm. Did your father see you coming here? I met father on my way here. He said he'll be coming here soon. Hmm. He doesn't usually come here at this time. Did he say why he's coming? I don't know. You can ask him yourself. There he is. Hey, Jacob. Hello. Rachel, your mother was searching for you. I'm going there now. Bye, Jacob. Bye, Rachel. Jacob, sit down. I have to talk to you about something. What is it? Hmm, I can see that you're doing great work with the sheep and in the farm. Thank you, Jacob. Oh, that's all right. No, no, Jacob. I appreciate your hard work. But just because you are my nephew, you don't have to work for nothing. I'm ready to pay you. No, uncle. I can't take any pay from you. Oh, Jacob, we can do that. I have to give you something in return for your work here. Hmm. I think I think I'm interested in something. What is it? Go on. Tell me. If you let me marry Rachel, then I shall work for you for 7 years. Huh? Hmm. Fine. I'll let you marry Rachel. I brother Give her to you than someone else. Oh, thank you, uncle. Ha <laughs> ha. Thank you. Jacob worked very hard for seven years. Years passed by and Laban got richer and richer by Jacob's hard work. One more month. It's just one more month and Rachel will be mine. But Laban was making other plans to deceive Jacob. He tricked his father. He tricked his brother. I'm going to get him this time. At the end of 7 years, Jacob approached Laban for marrying Rachel. Laban agreed and arranged a wedding feast. 
<laughs> this is wonderful. Here, have some more wine. Oh no, I've had enough. Come on, drink it up. This is a big day for you. All right. Here you go. <laughs> I have to get him drunk today. And here, have a little more. Uh, okay. Can you... Can you take me to my tent? I want to go to my tent. When Jacob was drunk, Laban took Jacob to his tent. Come here, Jacob. Here you see a wife. My wife, my love. Due to the intoxication and darkness in the tent, Jacob didn't realize that the woman was not Rachel. It was Leah. Good morning, dear. Uh, good morning. Leah, what are you doing here? Where is Rachel? Don't you remember? He slept with me yesterday. No, that cannot be. I've been cheated. Where is your father? He, he is in his tent. Good morning, Jacob. You, you cheated me. Jacob, let me... Why did you do this to me? You knew I worked for seven years for Rachel. Why? I'm sorry, son, but it's not the custom in our country to marry the younger daughter before elder one. You should have told me that before, rather than cheating me like this. Calm down, Jacob, calm down. I let you marry Rachel too. But... But what? But you'll have to work for me for another seven years. Huh? Another seven years? Mm. It's just another seven years, Jacob. Think about it. I will arrange for your marriage with Rachel in a week's time. Alright. I agree. I will work for you for seven more years if you give me a Rachel. It's done! Hee <laughs> hee, I fooled him again. And as Laban promised, he got Rachel married to Jacob. Jacob, from now on, you may have Rachel also as your wife. Under the supervision of Jacob, Laban's flocks, sheep and goats multiplied tenfold. Leah gave birth to many children and Rachel gave birth to a boy, who they named Joseph. Those were the days of contentment for all of them. But all this while, Jacob wanted to return to his land with his family. Hello, Joseph. Papa. Nana. Haha. <laughs> I love you so much. You seem very happy. How can I not be? I have a beautiful wife and great children. I am so lucky to have all of this. Hmm. But I know you. You want to return to your land for many days now. Yes. I want to go back to my land. Then why don't you talk to my father? I am. I am going to talk to him. But when? You've been thinking about this for many days now. I'll talk to him today. Here, hold him. I'll go right now and talk to him. Good luck, dear. Hey, Jacob. Why are you here? Who is looking after the sheep then? Rachel is taking care of that. 
I came here to talk to you. Talk to me. What's so important that you left the sheep and came here? It's important. You must listen. Hmm. All right. What is it? Please listen patiently. I've been thinking about telling this to you for many days now. Go on. Tell me, Jacob. I want to return to my homeland. I want to go back there with my wives and children. What? But but why? Aren't you happy here? I am happy, but I want to return to the land promised to my forefathers. But no, you can't just leave like that. I am sorry, but I have to go. Hmm. Then stay for a while longer. I will pay you whatever it takes. Okay, I will stay if you can pay me for my labor. Name your wages and I'll pay you. All right. Then you shall give me from your flock every black, speckled, spotted animal as my wages. All the white ones will be yours. That's uh, it's all right. I will give them. Then I'll stay. It's done then. Get back to your work. He is asking for too much. I will trick him again. He he. Laban had become very greedy, and he wanted to keep the entire animals for himself. He decided to trick Jacob again. Rachel, I'm going to the city. I'll be back before sunset. He's gone. Come on, sons. Where are we going, father? To the farm. It's our farm too. Why are we hiding then, father? Because Jacob must not know what we are doing. What are we doing, father? Will you shut up and just do as I tell you? Is that difficult? I'm sorry, father. Huh? Come here, you black one. Come on, you fools. Get inside and get all black, spotted or speckled ones. Father, you are brilliant. You are catching the black ones so that we don't have to give Jacob anything. Yes, I'm not giving Jacob anything. These are all yours. Laban did not want to give anything to Jacob, so he picked all the black, spotted and speckled animals and gave them to his sons. But when Jacob came back and saw the farm, he realized he had been cheated by Laban again. Ha! Huh. Laban, he cheated me again. What happened, dear? What happened? It's your father. What did he do this time? See this. There are only pure white sheep in this farm. He took all sheep that should have come to me. Oh dear, I'm sorry for what my father did. And your brothers, they keep saying that I stole all their wealth. But why? They are the ones who are stealing here. I think we'll have to escape from here with whatever we have left with. Else they will come back and take all what we have left. I think we should leave today itself. Let's go back to your father's land. Yes. my father's land you are right rachel let's leave tonight itself the next morning jacob left with his wives his children and all his belongings he was traveling towards canaan ah ha huh. there i got you are you all right yes come on let's hurry I knew he was a cheater. Father? Father, he took all our sheep too. He must have left 2 days ago, the thief. Father, I can see his footprints. Then we shouldn't be standing here anymore. Come on. Let's follow the prince and we'll catch him. He couldn't have reached far. We can catch him in a few days. Come on, sons. Laban kept following Jacob for 7 days. 
but on the seventh night he received a message from God himself. Laban, you should not touch Jacob. You shouldn't even say an unkind word to Jacob. Yes, my lord. Please, please forgive me. After a few days, Laban caught up with Jacob. But Laban remembered God's warning, and he was afraid of harming Jacob. You thought you could escape from me and my sons? I didn't try to escape. All these are mine. You only had a few skinny goats when I came to you. All that you have earned is because of my hard work. Don't start now. I would have killed you if the God had not stopped me. You should. At least now, you have learned that there is God to protect the weak. Hmm. All right. Now that you know that God is with us, let's make a treaty today. Treaty? What treaty? A treaty that you will never cross this monument ever to harm us. I would never want to see you ever again. I'll make that promise. I swear by the name of the Lord. Laban went back after making the promise to Jacob. Jacob then continued with his journey towards Canaan. Jacob then sent a messenger to Esau, informing him about his arrival. But when he returned, he had some bad news to share. Uh, master, Esau has sent an army of 400 men against you. What shall we do, master? Hmm, 400 men, is it? We must divide the flock into two groups. Yes, master. Half the family will go with one and the other half in another group. That way, if Esau attacks one group, then the others can escape. Ah, oh, that's a good idea, master. All right, go and tell this to others. That night, Jacob prayed to the Lord, thanking him and praising him for the favors he had shown Jacob since he left his father's house. He also begged God to intervene and stop Esau from attacking his family. Please, God, please help us from Esau's attacks. Who? Who are you? You mustn't ask. Ah! Stop! Stop! Ah! Ah! Why? Please! Ah! I'm tired of this running! I will not let go. Ah, ah, no, I will not let go. I am not running anymore. Ah, ah. You will no longer be called Jacob. You will now be known as Israel, which means the one who wrestled with God and prevailed. <laughs> I have seen God face to face and yet I live. Ha, ha, ha. Ah, oh, my leg hurts. I have to go on. I am ready. Ready for Esau or anyone in this world. Don't be afraid, dear. I'm not afraid. I have you. Jacob, you're here. It's been a long time. Where were you? Esau. My brother. Don't worry about the past, my brother. Thank you. You must meet my family. Are they your children? Yes. God had been kind to me. And what about the flocks of sheep and goats that I saw on my way? Yes, they are mine too. God has blessed me abundantly. And the camels and the cattle? Yes, but you must accept them as my gift to you. Oh ho! No, no. I have all the wealth I need. 
you may keep them please don't say no you must accept them for my satisfaction <laughs> i don't need gifts from my brother now come on home i will brother and so jacob returned to the land of canaan and made peace with esau father how many children did jacob have he had 12 sons and a daughter so children did you all like the story yes father shall i ask a few questions then yes george tell me the meaning of the name israel it means the one who wrestled with the god is it correct yes it's correct sit down matthew here is the last question yes father what is the message that you get from the story of jacob mm the story of jacob teaches us that god always protects and looks after the weak that's right good one matthew it's time for me to leave goodbye children wow it's so beautiful what is it jimmy Jimmy, oh, don't worry. He must be playing with a fly or something. Shut up, Jimmy. Huh? What is it, Jimmy? What's over there? He must be playing with you, Lucy. All right, all right. I'll come with you. Are you coming, George? No, no. He's playing with you. You go ahead and take a look. I'm just going to lie down here. Hey, Jimmy, stop. What's in here? Huh? It's a kitten. She's so cute. You look so tired. Didn't you eat your poor little thing? Where's your mother? It seems she's lost. Let me call Matthew and George. George, Matthew, come over here. Huh? Isn't that Lucy? Matthew, Matthew, stand up. George, Matthew. Huh? It's Lucy. Why is she calling us? Come on, Matthew. Let's go. She could be in some trouble. Huh? Coming, Lucy. <sighs> what happened, Lucy? Hey guys, look what I found. Wow, she is She is so beautiful. Isn't she? I found her in these bushes. She is alone and I couldn't find her mother anywhere. She looks so weak. Maybe her mother has gone out to fetch some food. Can I hold her, Lucy, please? Hmm. All right, here. Come here. Oh, you poor thing. Are you hungry? Where is your mama? Hello kids. Father John. What's going on here? We found a kitten by the bush, father. We are waiting for her mother to come back. This one looks so weak. I don't think she has eaten anything in days. George, go and get some milk. Quick. Yes, father. Hmm. Let's wait for her mother to come back till evening. And what if something happened to her mother? What if she doesn't come back? Then we will take care of her, Matthew. Don't worry. I've got the milk. Very good. Now keep it down there. All right. Let's sit here for some time. Father, can you tell us a story while we wait here for his mother? That's a great idea, Lucy. 
Now which story do you want me to tell you? You told us yesterday that you tell us the story of Prophet Jeremiah today. Ah, yes. Now listen carefully. In the little village of Anathoth, not very far from Jerusalem, a boy named Jeremiah was learning his lessons. Since Jeremiah was the son of a priest, he had more difficult lessons to learn and less time to play. But Jeremiah was quick to learn. He knew all about the history of Israel and how God had helped by leading them. As Jeremiah grew, he became bigger and stronger. His heart was filled with the love for his country and with the love of God. One day, as he was walking in his fields, Jeremiah, huh? I'm going to appoint you as the prophet of the nations. Huh? But Lord God, I'm too young. I do not know how to speak. Do not say that you are too young. You must go where I send you and say what I command you. I'm putting my words in your mouth. I will, Lord. Jeremiah, what do you see? I I see a branch of an almond tree and I see a cooking pot tilting from the north. In his vision, like the white flowers in the almond tree that was awake while everything else was dead, God said that he would fulfill every one of his words. Jeremiah, I watch over my words to see it fulfilled. And like the tilting pot, disaster is boiling from the north to destroy your land. Huh? Do not be afraid. I will make you strong. You will be like a fortified city. God told Jeremiah that evil days were coming upon his country. He told him that armies would come sweeping down from the north and would destroy Jerusalem and take the Israelites captive. This was the message which Jeremiah was supposed to deliver to the people. The message that God was about to punish the Israelites for their wrongdoings. And no better messenger could have been chosen. Jeremiah was quite fearless and steadfast like a rock. Nothing could stop him or tempt him to keep silence. Listen, O Israel, to the word of God. You have abandoned our God. Your prophet speaks in the name of idols. Your priests offer sacrifices to these idols. Your hands are stained with the blood of the innocent. Isn't this Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, the priest? Ah, yes, he is. Where was he all these days? Looks like he's sick. He is pretending to be a prophet. A prophet? No, not another one. We have enough of them already. Come back to God. He is merciful. Abandon your idols and do justice. Jeremiah, you better watch what you're saying. Are you trying to be a prophet? Jeremiah, my son, why don't you be a priest like your father? What you're doing is quite dangerous. I am only obeying our God, and I think you should do the same. Hmm. At first, however, things were easy for the young prophet. The good king Josiah was reigning, and he tried to make the people give up idol worship. King Josiah gave instructions to destroy the idols in the country. Altars and temples dedicated to idols were destroyed. From now on, Israel will have only one temple. Sacrifices will be offered only in Jerusalem. Idol worship will now be considered a crime deserving capital punishment. Hmm. Josiah is a smart king. We are becoming an empire like in the times of David. It won't be long before Solomon's glory returns to Israel. Yes, all the prophets are saying the same too. No. Not every prophet agrees. Jeremiah is still preaching about the coming disaster. <laughs> he is a fool. But the good days didn't last for long. In a few days, there was a war at Megiddo against Egyptians, and Josiah died fighting a furious battle. 
Oh no! He was such a good king. Yes. He took care of his people very well. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe he was punished by the Egyptian gods for destroying their idols. What? Hmm. You're right. Maybe we should worship Baal from now on. Hey, look! Isn't that Jeremiah walking up the stairs? Yes, it's Jeremiah. What is he going to do? People of Israel! God is punishing you for your sins! But Josiah was a good king! He destroyed all the idols! True faith means not just destroying the idols. It means writing the laws of the covenant in your heart. But... But we offer sacrifices as commanded by the God. Your sacrifices are in vain. No one will be able to save you. Move! Mm. Move aside! People of Israel, do not believe in empty promises. Who are you? How dare you speak like that in the house of the Lord? Yes, this is the house of the Lord. God will protect his house. You steal, murder, and commit other crimes. Then come to the house of the Lord. Do you think you'll be safe here? What is this place? A den of robbers? Huh? How dare you? Where are the gods? Yes, master. Arrest this man! He's speaking against our temple and our God! Take him away! Come with me, you! Jeremiah was arrested that day, and he was produced before the judges. The judges sent him away with an order forbidding him to enter the temple, ever. Jeremiah left the city that day and lived in exile for many years. In the meantime, Israel was attacked by King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Israel became the servant of Babylon and they were forced to pay heavy taxes. Even Jeremiah, he was exiled. He continued to write his message which he could no longer cry out loud. Write this Baruch. It is not truth, but it's hypocrisy going in Israel. Corruption is increasing day by day and the people have forgotten their Lord. Master, are these the words of the Lord? Mm. Yes, unfortunately, yes. His words are so terrible. Will the people accept his message? I don't know, Baruch. I hope they listen to his message. Huh? You have written down everything the Lord has told me. Tomorrow is the day of fasting. Since I'm not allowed to enter the temple, you must go and read the scroll before all people. But Master, they will arrest me if I read this before them. Don't worry, my son. The Lord will protect you. I... I... All right, Master. I will do as you have told. As Jeremiah had instructed, Baruch went to the temple next day and read the message from God to all the people. And the priests have become true. I will not accept any sacrifices from you. Your nation will be destroyed. Huh? No, it can't be true. But before Baruch could finish reading from the scroll, the officials of the king came and arrested him. Your people will become slaves. And you... Baruch, stop it! You must come with me to the king! Huh? God, take the scroll with him! Baruch was taken to the king, and the priest read out the message from the scroll. And because of this, your city will be destroyed! Huh? Your temple will be destroyed! Your people will become slaves again! What? How dare he? Give me that scroll! Here, my lord. Ah, uh, oh, word of God, huh? Ah, uh, arrest him and send him to the prison. I'll show him who the real God is, huh? No, 
No, please. Baruch was arrested that day and the king gave strict orders prohibiting Jeremiah to enter the city. Jeremiah, in the meantime, received another message from God. He went to the valley of Ben-Hinnom and carried a jar along with him. This is the valley where you sacrificed innocent babies to idols. This place will hereafter be called as the Valley of Slaughter. Huh? Oh no! Father, is it true? Is the God going to punish us? But there among the crowd was Pashur, the chief priest. He got infuriated by Jeremiah's words and he went upon him and struck him. I will put an end to your prophecies today. Here! Ah! Gods! Take him to the palace! Jeremiah was taken to the palace and was beaten the whole night. Ugh! Ah! Ah! You... You and your friends will become slaves to the king of Babylon. Jerusalem will be reduced to ashes. Ah! ah. Ha! You are a fool! And after a few days, Jeremiah got another message from God. Jeremiah... Make a yoke of wood, put it on your neck, and go to the king, Zedekiah. Yes, my lord. God told Jeremiah that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, was his loyal servant. He was using the king to destroy Israel and its people. Jeremiah was upset hearing the news, and he decided to go and deliver the message anyways. The next day, there was a meeting at the palace. King Zedekiah had invited neighboring countries to unite and fight against Nebuchadnezzar. We must unite and fight against Babylon. Yes, Babylon will fall if stand together. Wait, who is that? Isn't that Jeremiah, the prophet? <sighs> <sighs> What are you doing? How dare you enter the palace? I... I came here to deliver the word of God. I have handed over all your countries to my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. If you refuse to obey him and bend to his yoke, then your kingdom will be destroyed. How dare you? We are going to break the yoke of Babylon like this. Ha! Huh. You broke the wooden yoke. The Lord will place an iron yoke over your shoulder and you will die in a foreign land. Wait! I think we must listen to him. No, my king. He's just a mad person. Look at him. Does he look like a prophet to you? Don't worry. I'm going to take care of him. Guards, arrest him and throw him in the pit. Huh? Nobody believed Jeremiah. They arrested him and threw him in a well in the courtyard. The well was a horrible place. There was not enough water in the well, but there was deep, wet mud at the bottom into which he kept sinking. You and your prophecies will end in this well. And they left him there without food to die. Why was I ever born? Why should I live at all like this? Hated and despised by everyone. Lord, your word was my delight. It was sweet as honey. And I proclaimed it with joy. Why is it that you have abandoned me now? Jeremiah. God? Jeremiah, you speak only noble words. You shall be as my own mouth. Thank you, God.
that night, Jeremiah, who had sung waist deep, was saved by a servant of the king. Master, master. Huh. Who are you? Shh. Be silent, master. I've come to save you. Tie this rope below your arms. I will lift you up, master. The servant pulled out Jeremiah from the well and saved his life. Thank you, my son. May God bless you. Thank you, Master. We mustn't stay here any longer. Come, let's get out of here. Heeding the advice of priests and his ministers, King Zedekiah stopped paying tribute to Nebuchadnezzar. And as Jeremiah had foretold, in a few days, the Babylonian army attacked the city of Jerusalem. The Babylonian army pulled down the walls of Jerusalem and they set fire to the palace and the temples. Everything happened like how Jeremiah had prophesied. They looted the town and took all their valuables. Thousands of people were enslaved and taken to Babylon. They killed King Zedekiah, the ministers and all the priests as well. And one day, Jeremiah, I punished those who broke my covenant. The days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. I will write my law in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Jeremiah was destined to live in utter loneliness. He was always made fun of and he was ill-treated everywhere. He lived long enough to witness the disasters he had predicted. But after his death, people realized that he spoke the truth and that made them repent and return to God. Oh, it's such a sad story. Hmm, I know. But as they say, God works in mysterious ways. Hey, look at him. Looks like he was listening your story too. Ha ha ha. Were you listening to my story, you cutie? Hey, what are we gonna call him? Hmm. He, he growls a lot. Let's call him Lion. No, no. Let's call him Tiger. Ha ha. Tiger. That's a nice name. I liked it too. All right. It's time for the questions. Yes, Father. Hmm. Now, Matthew, answer this. Where was Jeremiah born? Anathoth. Jeremiah was born in the village of Anathoth. Very good, Matthew. Now, who can answer this? What was the first vision that God showed Jeremiah? God showed him a vision of an almond tree covered with white flowers and a cooking pot. And George, what did he mean by these visions? In his vision, like the white flowers in the almond tree that was awake while everything else was dead, God said that he would fulfill every one of his words. And what about the cooking pot? God showed him that like the cooking pot tilting from the north, Israel was waiting to be attacked from the north. Very good, George. That's all for today. Now go home and take care of our new member. Here you go. Thank you, Father. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, Goodbye Father. Father.